we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of early diagnosis and early recognition uh, in Hunter's syndrome. Why is MPS2 difficult to recognize in practice? Uh, what are some of the early signs and symptoms? Uh, we know this is a deficiency of the iduronate sulfatase, which leads to progressive accumulation of gags in multiple tissues. Uh, some, but not all, patients have central nervous system involvement, which is related to the accumulation of heparan sulfate in the central nervous system. About two-thirds of our MPS2 patients are affected with CNS disease, while the remainder have what we refer to as the attenuated form. So we know it's multisystemic and progressive, and that many of the manifestations in various organ systems are irreversible at some point. But many of the signs and symptoms overlap with common pediatric problems, but I think the important thing here um, is that we remember when we look at our pediatric patients that if a patient has three or four different things going on, very often there's a relationship. It's not coincidental that a patient has three or four or five different medical issues that we need to step back and just say, you know, is there some relationship between these various things that we're seeing? Because often there is. The very frequent upper respiratory illnesses and ear infections, of course it's common for kids to have those kinds of things. But these are kids that often have two, three, four sets of ear tubes, you know, in their lifetime, sometimes more. And they may have tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy. They may go have their adenoids grow back, and the ENT goes back and removes the adenoids again a second time or a third time. Uh, so lots of ENT issues, hernias, you've heard umbilical, inguinal hernias. Again, not so rare in pediatrics, but think about the combination and think about this particularly if it's not a premature infant because we see that very commonly there, less so in the full-term babies. Chronic diarrhea, very frequent problem in MPS2. I've seen lots of kids who at diagnosis had already seen a gastroenterologist for evaluation of chronic diarrhea. So it can be one of the early findings and it really, we see it in MPS3 also, but not so much in some of the other MPS disorders. So it, it is an important finding, uh, an important early clue. So take a step back, look at the whole clinical picture and, um, and think about, do you have a genetic disorder? And specifically, with this combination, could it be MPS2? But which are the early symptoms? That's what we're really wanting to focus on here, the early signs and symptoms. Here, uh, if you take a look at this slide, what is plotted is the median age of onset of symptoms in this series, uh, published in 2008. Uh, and the earliest ones are highlighted here in the yellow box uh, with their prevalence. So again, the recurrent otitis media and hernia show up at the very bottom. And nasal obstruction, uh, chronic runny nose, uh, and noisy breathing, very common observation, and then right above it, the coarse facial features. So these are seen really early on. You can see this uh, red line is about two and a half years of age. So these are things that are seen very early in life. So if you start seeing a combination of these things, again, it's that combination that's starting to be very suggestive. And above it, you see other things that are very common, of course, we've mentioned. Enlarged liver and spleen, enlarged tonsils and adenoids, big tongue, joint stiffness, all of the uh, other common features. 
airway disease is detailed in a little more uh, detail here. We mentioned the recurrent infections. Uh, there are many other uh, respiratory problems that we see in our patients. They do have restrictive disease due to their small rib cage and stiffness of the joints. Uh, they may have sleep apnea, so you may get a history of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and sleep studies can be very important for the evaluation of this. Tracheobronchomalacia uh, tends to be a problem a little bit later on. It's a, a major problem in our older patients with MPS2, as is respiratory insufficiency. Here you see some pictures of the joints that may help you. You can see the claw-like hand here, stiff fingers. You get the idea here with the elbows that they cannot be fully extended, so the elbows are often involved pretty early as is shoulder flexion. Um, the carpal tunnel syndrome, a uh, little bit later usually, but uh, if you see carpal tunnel syndrome in childhood, you certainly have to think about MPS because it's very rare in the general pediatric population in, and certainly in any other setting. Uh, growth, you've already heard, is typically uh, normal early on, so you can't rely on looking for short stature, even though the patients are ultimately short. Uh, in fact, they often are above average in size early on. Uh, but they typically do have macrocephaly. They often have macrocephaly and frequently, I think, are sent to neurologists or neurosurgeons for evaluation of a big head. So that can be one of the things that early on catches somebody's attention uh, is the macrocephaly. Uh, the bones are involved all over with dysostosis multiplex. You see findings throughout the skeleton and they impact the patient everywhere. Uh, in the GI tract, the, uh, the hepatosplenomegaly causes the big belly. They can be really hard to palpate, though, uh, I think, compared to a lot of other patients. You know, their skin is thick, and, you know, sometimes they're squirrely and behaviorally different. You really have to palpate them carefully. And sometimes... Uh, pediatricians think, well, they're just a little bit distended because they have this chronic diarrhea and, you know, maybe have gas and so forth, which they do a lot of times have chronic diarrhea and so forth. So it can be confusing, but, you know, they, they often have these big bellies and the watery diarrhea and can have both the umbilical and inguinal hernias. Uh, the uh, cognitive involvement, the CNS involvement in MPS2 patients can present in several different ways. There are patients who are delayed from the beginning, who are delayed from birth, have a big head, and then there are many patients, the majority, who have a, an initial period of normal development followed by cognitive slowing and neurologic regression. And so it's this neurologic regression that's classical of the uh, severe form of MPS2. And they almost all have pretty significant behavioral abnormalities with hyperactivity, aggressive behavior, impulsivity, and so forth. So it's easy for them to be misdiagnosed as having ADHD or autism spectrum disorder. History of frequent or recurrent surgeries should trigger clinical suspicion of MPS2. Again, this uh, is data that largely came from our Hunter Outcomes Survey, the registry that's been so helpful to us in seeing um, uh, much of what the natural history of Hunter syndrome looks like. And here again, I'll show you the prevalence of all surgeries, uh, ear tubes, hernia repair, adenoidectomy, tonsillectomy, carpal tunnel. These are the big ones up at the top. So when you see these, think about MPS2. Uh, again, a, 
some of the patients having other things that you see down here, uh, but these tending to occur later and less frequently. Uh, and here we're looking at the age at, for a surgical procedure for the various procedures on the previous list. And again, the common ones are also the early procedures, hernia repair, tympanostomy, adenoidectomy, tonsillectomy. Any procedure, very, very common for a patient to have some sort of surgical procedure by two and a half years of age. So in this study, uh, our patients with MPS2 had a median of three surgical procedures. Uh, the first procedure taking place at a median age of 2.6 years. That means half of the patients had surgery before two and a half years of age. 56% uh, had some sort of surgery before the diagnosis of MPS2. And there was a median of two procedures that took place while MPS2 was undiagnosed. Again, patients being at risk. Uh, during those surgical procedures, and the big ones were hernia, ENT, and carpal tunnel. I want to just mention now the anesthetic complications. So your clinical suspicion should be triggered by the combination of hernia repair plus ENT intervention. You've heard this now several times repeatedly, but you know, I think it bears repeating because it is such an important uh, combination. Carpal tunnel syndrome, surgery in childhood, or if you have a patient in your practice who has gone to surgery and has been difficult to intubate or there's been difficulty with extubation, again, that should be something that makes you say, well, why is that? Wonder why they couldn't extubate that patient. Should make you think about the possibility of an MPS disorder because these are patients where this happens very commonly and it's likely to be worse the next time. So you're gonna be starting with your clinical recognition that you may be dealing with a patient who has an MPS disorder. So. If, if that's the case, you're gonna first order your urine gag analysis. If that's positive, then you're gonna move ahead to the gold standard test for confirmation of the diagnosis, which is measurement of the enzyme activity, the iduronate 2 sulfatase, which we typically do in blood. It can be either plasma or leukocytes. You can do it in cultured skin fibroblasts, but usually don't need to. Uh, and once you demonstrate that enzyme deficiency, then you want to either exclude multiple sulfatase deficiency by measuring a second sulfatase, on, which you can do on the same sample, uh, to confirm the diagnosis and rule out that less common disorder, multiple sulfatase deficiency, or you can proceed to the molecular analysis, the DNA testing, to show the mutation in the patient. That's genetic testing. There is a urine spot test for GAGs, for uh, mucopolysaccharides. Uh, you know, it can be helpful if positive, but not really all that reliable. So if you can, you order the quantitative uh, urine GAGs which are typically very high in newborns and decline uh, in the early years of life here from birth through age 20. Uh, so it's very important that you have normative values for each age group. Uh, again, though, you have to remember that there can be false negatives. The geneticist even has looked at them and thought, oh, this might be MPS2 ordered urine gags, came back negative, kind of dismissed the diagnosis, and then the patient goes for years again. So you have to be a little bit careful even with this. Um, you may get a sample that's too dilute, and then again, you, you don't get a positive test result. So if your clinical suspicion is strong, you know, even if your urine gags come back 
normal on a quantitative, I think you still need to go further. If you can get the gag electrophoresis, that is very helpful, I think, because you should never in a normal sample, uh, in a normal person, get the pattern that you see in MPS 1, 2, and 6 of the elevated dermatan and heparan sulfates. Most of the mutations in the gene for iduronate 2 sulfatase that we see in patients with MPS 2 are unique. There is no common mutation like we see in patients with sickle cell disease, for example, or even in cystic fibrosis where you have one mutation that's 50% of alleles. There are recurrent mutations that you know have been seen and reported before, but most are uncommon. So. Um, Many, and many are unique, so prediction of the phenotype from identifying the mutation can be difficult. You cannot always say just by looking at the mutation whether the patient is going to have a severe phenotype with CNS involvement or whether it's going to be an attenuated phenotype. Sometimes you can because there are some patients who have a complete deletion of the gene or a rearrangement, and then you know it's going to be a severe phenotype. Uh, but if they have a missense mutation, for example, you don't know. It could be either. So, uh, but it is helpful for identifying carriers and prenatal diagnosis. Um, it's really the only way you can do that because there's an overlap of enzyme activity between carriers and normal individuals. It's obviously prenatal diagnosis is only possible in families where the carriers have been identified in advance. So you want to, of course, once you've made a diagnosis, counsel not only the parents, but you know any other potentially affected carriers in the family of their reproductive risk because they have other options besides prenatal diagnosis. They have the options of not having children, not having any biological children, adoption. They can use donor eggs. You know, there are other things that they can choose. And so ideally, you'd like to identify the carriers before they begin reproductive planning so you can sit down with them and offer them their full array of reproductive options including prenatal diagnosis, really before they start making decisions uh, about reproduction. And, you know, then they're going to be best informed and in doing it in the, in the most educated setting.